All right. Well, good morning. So the last six weeks, I don't know if you know, you've been here for all of them. That was kind of a running story that was going on, kind of typical of neighborhoods as a whole. That's what we tried to capture it with. You've got some neighbors over here that we actually never met. We never saw them. They're creepers. <laughs> no, in real life, they're creepers. No. They, they're, you know, they're evidently interested in the neighborhood, but they don't actually engage with the neighborhood. And you've got this family that won't stop procreating in this home right here, <laughs> right? And they don't give a rip about the neighborhood. They're just so consumed with their own stuff and their own life. They can't even remember this guy's name. Neighbor over here, it's Gary or Jerry or Barry or Harry, whatever they use week to week, right? And this guy doesn't give, well, he cares about his neighborhood, but he's got this religious guy next to him. And he can't quite figure him out. He can't sort that out, what he's all about. And he faces a crisis in his life, something he didn't count on. But interestingly enough, this guy's got a crisis in his life. And this guy can't figure out why he deals with it the way that he does. And he somehow thinks God's involved, loses his wife. And now there's an interaction in the neighborhood. And for some reason, maybe the least likely is one who has a ripple effect throughout the neighborhood. It's an amazing story. That's our neighbor, right? That's the hood that we live in. This whole story, week to week, has been wrapped around a phrase that Jesus used a number of times. And it's been the foundation of what we've launched from the last six weeks, and it's a simple statement where Jesus says, love your neighbor like you love yourself. Go ahead and do that. Now, he gives some rationale and some reason. We've looked at it over the last weeks as to why that would be. And I want to go back over it again one last time today. Because we really have to get it. We really do. And many of us do already. But I would love for all of us to look at our king and go, how did you think and how did you operate? And what were you, how were you processing your neighborhood? Which ends up being the whole world for him. And how did you think about it? Because... We've said we're followers of yours, and so we want to follow you. So imagine this, if you would. Three separate people write their own biography of one individual's life. He's a significant, influential person, and they each write that story from their own unique angle and their perspective of what they've seen and experienced with that person. You would expect, over the course of those three biographies, to have some probably some differences. There's a chance that the stories might overlap to some degree, but they probably would tell it slightly different from what they saw and what they experienced. Uh, They would tell the story of the life of this person. And uh, where it would overlap, you would know it overlapped because they might tell the same story, the same incident, the same teaching, the same axiom or quote from his life that they would all record because they all experienced it, and it would have been significant enough for them to recite it in their biographies. Well, this is what happens, and Jesus is the subject of the biography. Uh, Three of his friends write a biography. Two of them hung out really close with him. One came a little bit later, and he asked a bunch of questions, may have observed Jesus' life himself, but he writes about Jesus' life as well. Jesus' three friends are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. No last names, sorry. But if you're interested in Googling them, you could Google the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Mark, and you would find out their backgrounds, and you would see who they were and the story that they tell. And there is a number of places, there are a number of places where they overlap the story and they tell the same incident, slight nuances sometimes, but they tell the same thing. And what we've been looking at is one of those instances where they each recite and record an experience with Jesus. Likely not exactly the same one. So likely as Jesus repeated this a number of times, but there was something really pressing on Jesus' heart, something really important to him. And this is what he shares in in some incidents that these three biographers write. You've heard it before. I think you've heard it all six weeks, actually. And here it is again from Matthew's biography. Chapter 22 Verses 37 to 39, Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And then without missing a beat, without separating the two, he says the second is equally important. It's co-equal. Love your neighbor as yourself. Question. 
why would those incidents have been so significant to these three biographers that 20 years after the fact, when they're writing out their story for the world to read, they all include this in their story? Why would they write it down? Why was it so significant? Or even more so, and even more profound really for them, is when Jesus had died, they all quit what they were doing. They quit their professions. And then they went into full-time service or volunteering for that message for him. So profound had it been in their lives that this is what they choose to do, tell the world, travel around the world, the known world, and say, this is what Jesus thought. This is what was important to him. And they do that, and ultimately, some of them die violently for it. Every one of them is persecuted because it's not actually the most popular message in their world. So why would they do this? Well, there's a couple of reasons. There may be more, but I want to give you two reasons why. It's who said it, coupled with what happened not long after he said it. So it's Jesus that says it. What changed the importance for these biographers, each one of them, was that not long after Jesus repeated the statement that we just read, Jesus died being the kind of neighbor that he told them to be. Late one Thursday evening, after having dinner with some friends, two of these friends anyways, just like he had predicted it would happen, Jesus is arrested, tortured, publicly shamed, and killed on a cross by those who did not like his emphasis on God, neighbor love for all people. And so they tried to silence him, which is what we do. And his uh, message was going to go into darkness, they thought. And they were sure they'd accomplish that because by the following Friday afternoon, they had successfully nailed Jesus' limp body to a cross and he was gone. However, by early morning on the following Sunday, that which they thought was the end of the chapter was really the first chapter in a story that changed everything for these three guys. Two and a half days after Jesus dies on a cross, he comes back to life. And for sure two of them, probably all of them, saw him alive. Shockingly, he's raised back to life just like he predicted. And although you and I were not eyewitnesses to this, you have to admit that someone who can predict their own death and resurrection to a T, it's pretty impressive. Go ahead and try it. You may want to try it soon, or you want to like, you know, be careful with it. But it is pretty impressive. Now imagine that you are eyewitnesses to that. You are there, you hear his prediction, you see it all unfold in front of your eyes, seeing someone die, and then suddenly be fully alive just a few days later tends to be a significant life, life, life event, right? Right? Of course it is. Like, really, like put yourself there. Transcend the story of the Bible. Put yourself really there. Like, it really happened. Imagine looking up at the cross, your friend... Imagine two and a half days later, he shows up again. All the wounds of his body are still there. He was dead, dead. Now he's alive, live. It's something you'd write about. You'd record it. You'd tell a whole bunch of people about it. It might even have the profound transformational effect in your life. You'd never be the same again. You would be changed by it. Your worldview would change. What's important to you would change. What's significant and what matters and what you give your life to might profoundly be shaped in just three days. Because you saw it. You experienced it. You were part of it. And so were these three. And suddenly, Jesus goes from being a good example and a good friend of a good life and a terrific teacher and potential king and a wonderful message of love to being the definitive rescuer, redeemer, savior, hope for humanity, and their hope. Their hope. Which is what he said his death and resurrection was all about. And when you're an eyewitness to that, the things the person has said or taught or even commands you to do, they become indelibly important to you. You can't just brush them off. It's not optional. You don't blow it off and go, oh, that was good for him. I'm not that kind of person. I, I couldn't possibly participate in the things that he does. No, you actually are so compelled, you do it 
without really even being told by anybody to do it. It gives the words of this person you have followed and looked at a new level of authority and power and urgency, and it moves from being good suggestions and clever ideas, and you begin to align your entire life with everything and all that he said, and you can't help yourself. Because it's real, and it's so profoundly. And that weekend, this loving God and loving neighbors moved from an optional to a flat-out focus of their lives, which it's intended to do for us, too. Here's the second reason I think it became so compelling for these three. It was the way Jesus radically blended a couple of ideas that had never before been fused together, inseparable from one another. Jesus' basic premise was this, and we've tried to point it out each weekend. The idea that Jesus presented of loving God was actually not new. That was a, that was a, a, a thing within the Jewish faith, and for others as well that joined that faith. Nor was the idea of loving your neighbors new. We've said that before. Although that love was limited to those who think, believe, behave like we do or like they did or wanted them to be like that. And that was common in Jewish writings and religion. But what was shocking was that Jesus inextricably blended and fused the love of God and love of neighbor. Never again could those ever be separated. They couldn't be. All neighbors, that was. Those who like us and those who aren't anything like us. And then he pointed to himself as the example of how this normally works in those who choose choose to become his followers, linked together. You might think of a mental image this way, that Jesus baked a cake, blended all the ingredients, and now they can never be separated. Just try it sometime. Bake up a cake and now separate the ingredients. Don't bother. It actually can't be done. In other words, what Jesus was saying, that this was so revolutionary, and it was this, that the love of God is always revealed in our love for our neighbors. It always is. It always is. How was God's love for humanity revealed? Through Jesus Christ, who came to win all his friends to his way of thinking, right? While you were yet distant from him, not like him, didn't even like him, didn't know him maybe, He comes into this world and is the greatest neighbor ever for us. And this is what he invites us to be. You see, we love the idea of loving God. And we may even know how vital it is to our lives, but to extrapolate what Jesus was doing, if you ever want to do an evaluation of your love for God, a little bit of a gut check, you know how you check it out? Because it's a little bit ethereal. How do you love the people around you? Uh, more so, how do you love the people around you who aren't like you? Who you formerly didn't have that much interest in? Who were odd or different or from another faith or another place or another time or they're just irritating? How do you love them? That indicates love for God. We've connected the vertical and the horizontal. And I just want to remind us again, that's not Brad's idea. If it was, it's not worth following but it is our king's idea. And he went to a cross and came back to life again. So we would live and breathe and be these kinds of people in our world. There may be other reasons why this was so significant to these three and some others. But those are a couple to think about. And that's been our jumping off point each week. And I just wanted to repeat it because it's so significant to the one that we follow, and to the world and to our neighborhoods around us. When we launched this series, we started with looking at possibly the most famous neighbor of the last half century. Uh, Many of us grew grew up watching him on television, Mr. Rogers, uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Music was a big part of Fred Rogers' life, and he included it in uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Uh, We've heard one of the songs, like, It's a Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. I will not sing it. You're welcome. Uh, at the end of the broadcast, he would sing another song. I don't know if he said it, sang it every time, but for sure on Friday, every Friday he would sing, it's such a good feeling to know you're alive. It's such a happy feeling you're growing inside. And you wake up ready to say, I think I'll make it a snappy new day. And then he would snap his fingers like, hey, some of you watched it. Yes, yes. Now, there's another song that he would sing. It wasn't his most popular but it's one that 
I can recall. And uh, here's a short clip of the over the 30 plus there years that he did this. So the reason I show you that is if you were to ask Mr. Rogers, like, what's the deal with the song? He would say, you know, sometimes children have a hard time knowing how to say I love you. They might even feel the emotion. They might feel a love for mom and dad or their siblings, but they don't know how to express it. So like kids fight sometimes, right? Just don't know, how, don't know exactly how to express it. And Mr. Rogers would say, well, yeah, writing a note is a way to say I love you. Cleaning up your room is a way to say I love you. Sending a card understanding these are ways to show I love you and I care well I think this is not just something that children might bump into we may not know as adults how to love our neighbors around us we may need a little help with that some ideas some suggestions sometimes we would say I think I should but then we draw a blank and we go I just I don't know how like what would I do so I'm not like a stalker in the neighborhood right (laughs) And that my love is actually received as genuine and I care. And how do I do that? But, you know, some of us have been wired up like I've been wired up. And uh, I'm a bit of an introvert. And it's actually really intimidating to me to bridge into relationships or greet people that I don't know. And for me, it's a bit of a discipline. Sometimes it's a cover-up for my own insecurities, if I'm honest with you. And some of us are like that, who we love our neighbors, we love the people we work next to, we honestly do, but we're so afraid that we'll do it wrong or we'll be misunderstood, and then we don't do anything. And we, we don't like, take the risk and say, I care and I love. And so maybe some ideas would be helpful. Some of us feel guilty that we don't think we do it enough And so just these last conversations, these last weeks, you've walked away from here going, I just feel rotten about how bad a neighbor I am because I should be doing more. Well, can we just put that aside today? And can we just talk about some of the things that people are doing? And they're, you know, the efforts they're making to try to genuinely love people at work that they work next to and neighbors that live right beside them, friends at school, that kind of thing. We try to simplify this around here, try to demystify the whole thing, and we simply say, here's what you do. Could we do this much? Could we take notice? And could we take interest? Take notice and take interest. Look around the office, the place at work, school, and notice. Like, that's listen. Listen to conversations. Not like weird thing, okay? (laughs) But when you're part of conversation, stop talking. And listen, ask some questions. Find out what the people you work with and live next door, what their interests are, what their hobbies are, what makes them happy, what makes them sad, what they spend their weekends doing, what they're engaged in. Find out about them. If you don't know their names, start there. Because you'll always love someone more whose name you know. These are simple things. Listen to stories. You know who we love to talk about? ourselves let your friends your neighbors talk about themselves and you listen that's that's taking notice now what would taking interest look like well make your neighbors interest your interests don't try to make your interest their interest notice and observe and discover be part of what they're a part of ask questions learn from them acknowledge the important events and dates in their lives If you can, again, without being weird, okay? (laughs) Find out when birthdays are. If there's a graduation happening, celebrate with them. Be part of their lives. That doesn't mean you go to the graduation. You write a note saying, way to go. Like, I never thought you'd get out of middle school. (laughs) No, no, no. It's being observant. It's noticing and taking interest in them. If you're baking something in your home, bake something for them. Bring it over to them. Just gifts of love and appreciation and interest in them. You know what you can also do? This is like going to cost you something. Make your garage and the tools in your garage and the food in your pantry public space. You won't get your food back and some tools will be gone forever. 
but nobody in your neighborhood does that. That's taking interest. That's holding what Jesus has given us loosely so others can take it. Uh, He held his life pretty loosely. And we took it. The stuff in our garage, the stuff in our pantry isn't that big a deal. Okay, so here's some things. I'm going to tell you some stories of some people that are doing some things to show others that they love them and they care about them. Uh, Yesterday was a prime example. I cheer for you because I had the privilege of being at the finish line and passing medals to people as they came in. And I must have met, I don't know, half of the people who were runners and hikers. So many of you invited friends from work to hike the day with you. Invited neighbors around you to come and be part of what you were doing. And you spent four or five, eight hours on the hills. Some of you were really slow. <laughs> but that, that was conversations. That's, that's interest. That's love. 150 of us volunteered. Some of us actually did both. We hiked a little bit and volunteered a little bit because we wanted to go with our neighbors or colleagues at work or friends from school. And then we served as well. Like, what an incredible event in our community. I, I get to hear the stories of people as they cross the finish line and they talk about what happened and the cool experience it was for them. And our whole deal is this, that they would actually see the love of Jesus for the way that's impacted us. So, like, that's taking notice and that's taking interest. Way to go. Way to go for that. I think of a couple in our church who took notice. They loved to four by four. Uh, four wheel out in the desert. And so kind of on a whim, they talked to some other neighbors and friends and said, why don't we do some Saturday where we'll just get some four by fours and we'll go ride out in the desert. And so they did. I think there were 12 or 13 four by fours that showed up on this property. Just took interest. That's all they did. They, they loved to four by four. Some, some others did too. And so off they go in the desert. And of course, that's the weekend we get flooded out. Monsoon Harvey or whatever it was, was here. They could only spend a few hours together, but it left an imprint. They were just cared for. They were like, somebody said, you matter, come ride in the desert with me. I think of a friend who loves to play tennis. He discovered some neighbors up and down his street loved to play tennis. And you know what he decided to do? He decided to do a, like a Saturday tennis tournament. Just to be with his friends. And then what he did is he invited some friends from church who liked to play tennis and they hung out together for the day. And they played tennis late into the Saturday night because there were so many that were interested. He just took interest. He noticed and he took interest in that. I think of a friend who threw a party. I think it was a birthday party for herself. How vain is that, right? (laughs) But she did strategically in that she invited people from work and places that she just connects with and some friends from her church family. And we had a wonderful time together that evening, getting to know one another, rubbing shoulders together, took notice and took interest. A few months ago, a family in our church took notice that some neighbors down the way from them had experienced a tragic family loss. Their 20-year-old son suddenly had had been found dead in their home. They took notice and they took interest and they went and they cared for that family and came alongside and they offered us to help them through that period of grief. Is that awesome or what? And we were able to walk through that journey a little bit with the family. Through that, our facility was made available for a memorial service for them. That's because a neighbor noticed and then didn't stay at home and go, well, they probably have family. Somebody will look after them. Somebody will love them. No, they walked over. And they introduced themselves and said, whatever we can do, we're so sad with you. Take notice, take interest. Last weekend, 19 people went to Mexico. By all appearances, to build a house for a family who didn't have much of a home other than a shelter. But it really, in the end, wasn't about building a home for them, though they did that. If you were to talk to the 19 people that went, it was an expression of love for Jose and his wife and their children, to work alongside them, to get to know them, to share meals together, and yes, build a home for them. But that's a lingering relationship where now we're able to help kids with some education and dad with possibly some employment. You know know what dad and his sons do for a living? They walk the beach selling wares to tourists. Do you think maybe he might want to have something a little 
more fulfilling in his world? Sure he does. You see, it's, it's, it's taking notice. It's not just we came to build a house. We came to notice you and take interest in you. And we'll, if we don't even build the house, which we will, we're going to do some other things because we're interested. Just like Jesus is. We're interested. We're interested. A few weeks ago, one of our, after one of our neighbor love talks, uh, mom was visiting a local kid's like, play date, like trampoline kind of enterprise. And uh, she was watching all the little kids and she was there with her own kids and uh, talked to the owner of the place and said, you know, I just had this idea. I think this might be a great way for me to connect with my neighbors through kids and bringing them here and doing an event here and uh, just be a way to connect with my neighbors who all have little kids. The owner comes out after the conversation and gives her 100 free certificates and he says, I believe in what you're talking about. If you give these out to your neighbors, you, you come. The first hour's on me. And I just think what you're trying to do in your neighborhood is so cool. Taking interest in something that she noticed. Sunday night in one of uh, the neighborhoods right here in West Wing, uh, one of our families uh, figured something out, just I think more by chance. They have a portable fire pit and they move it out onto their driveway. And they just started sitting out there enjoying some music and some beverages and some fun time together. Now I think there's like 20 plus neighbors that show up every Sunday night to sit in their driveway. There's a whole group of people who leveraged Halloween and invited neighbors to come to a sidewalk barbecue. And the connections that have happened, the friendships, how that's forming and changing a street. It happened just the street just down from us. Felt so bad about phoning the police to keep them quiet. No, I didn't do that. One of our clever staff suggested this, that you could even go egg your neighbor's home and get up really early and offer to clean their home for them. May, again, maybe not something you would recommend. So, uh, when we first moved to our city, uh, we set it in our hearts that we were going to love the neighbors up and down our street, just love them. Uh, and we tried all kinds of creative, interesting ways, some which were an abysmal failure, and uh, others actually you know, made an imprint. I remember Elfie and myself one day, uh, because it was a new neighborhood, they had sod show up in their front. We looked at each other and went, we can sod their backyard. And so we went and sodded their backyard. And the imprint that that left on my body. <laughs> but on their hearts as well. It was something we could do. Take notice, take interest. Maybe the most profound experience is a neighbor uh, that lived across from us who uh, uh, was really private in his life, he and his wife, really private in their world. And uh, we tried so many different ways to you know, bridge into their world and to love them. And we would take food over to their home and uh, we would invite them to neighborhood get-togethers that we had and so on. They seldom came. They came one Christmas Eve, but... They were so deeply into the eggnog at that point that I'm not sure they remember the evening. Um, but we did that for seven years. And you know, at some point, like year two or three, you think, are you, are you ever gonna respond to these gestures of grace and love? Because we love, but we, you, know, you keep doing it. You, you keep doing it. Seven years into that non-friendship, we were doing some work in our front yard, had our garage open and uh, just cleaning some stuff out. And he walks across the street. Uh, he lived directly across from us. And he said, uh, hey, I just, I, uh, I just want to apologize for something. I said, oh, Jim, what's that? What do you want to apologize for? He said, well, like the last three weeks, there's been a lot of police and paramedic activity here. And I, I just, I'm really sorry for that if that was disruptive. Well, it all happened through the night and we hadn't seen anything. Like talk about notice, right? And uh, so, of course, you know, like, we're sorry for that because we really learned to care for him. And he said, no, I just wanted to apologize. He said, I have to tell you that the last three weeks, on three occasions, my wife has tried to take her life or threatened seriously to do that. And so I had to call 911. And it happened last night again, and they, they took her away this time. And of course, there's sadness, and you grieve with him. It's so sad. And then he said this. He said, you know, we've lived across the street from you for seven years, but we've been watching you. 
But you see, I knew you were a pastor. And I thought what you were doing was try to get us to come to your church and involve us in your faith stuff. And we're not interested in that at all. But I think maybe that's not the case. And I just don't know what to do right now. And I wonder if you'd help me. And that led to a wonderful friendship. Intimate clothes that we still share today. And I just think sometimes, like, what, what if year three we had said, it's just not worth it. It's worth it. It's worth the continual engagement and acts of love. We love without wanting anything back, expecting anything back. Just love like Jesus. Like, we know this. He died on a cross without expectation that we would have to become his followers. We chose that. And having chosen it, we now follow him. And we increasingly think like him. And we increasingly take his values. And we increasingly, increasingly become like him. So that our neighbors think we're superstars, right? Not on your life. So they would somehow put together that Jesus loves them. And his truth is truth. And it's filled with hope, not condemnation. It's life and joy and hope and a future and a destiny that's attractive and appealing. And some reason, Jesus said, I'm going to trust my followers to do that rather than me directly intervening all the time myself. I trust them. They'll, they'll do it. They'll see what I've done for them and they'll just do this. And there are places of work where they live, at school, where they recreate. I know they'll do it. And so many are. And I bless you for that. I want to show you a clip from season 11, episode 4 of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. This came on February the 18th of 1981. I want to just be transparent here. It's a tearjerker. Okay? And I'm not doing it for that reason. I'm not. If you don't cry, good. I have every time I see it. But it's a story of taking interest and, and taking, taking notice and taking interest. Uh, Mr. Rogers would consistently get letters from parents and children who would want to come on his show because like, he just had won their hearts, right? And he got many and many, many, many of these letters. He got one particular letter from a little boy in Wisconsin, and he was up in that area on some other things, and he thought, well, I'll just, yeah, you know, I'll call. I'll see. So he called the family. They got together, and ultimately that little boy, 10-year-old little boy, Jeff, uh, was on his show. And, uh, but it started because he took notice and took interest. Take a look at this story. So Mr. Rogers had an impact on who Jeff became, on his sense of self. You're my neighbors. You know what they want to know? That you and I like them. That we think about them. That we're interested in them. That we've noticed them. Just like Jesus does for us. So at the close of this series, I want to ask you, will you pray for your neighborhood? Will you pray for your friends, the people you go to school with? And not just that Jesus would bless them, for sure that, yeah. But would you pray that Jesus would give you the opportunity, he will, to influence their life? He'll give you ideas, he'll give you creative ideas. And then will you have the boldness and the courage that maybe swings against your personality or your best intuition? And simply love the people around you. You don't live where you live, work where you work, play where you play. Go to school where you go to school. Because the neighborhood is like, like it's got the right house at the right price. The school gives you the kind of education that you really want and need. The hot yoga is really hot. <laughs> the place of work gives you a good salary. No. Jesus has placed you there as an ambassador for his love wherever you find yourself. It's the greatest privilege he's given his followers to do that. Let us do that with grace that we could be mistaken for him. Jesus, you go ahead and do that in our souls and our lives. This was not merely a lesson that you taught. It wasn't a good idea that you came up with. It wasn't a make work project or a way to get people committed. No, it was a, meant to be an expression of yourself in this world. And now in our time, in our generation, in this city, where we are right today, you're trusting us that we're going to 
because we're followers of yours and we've seen the cross and we've seen an empty tomb, that we'll simply follow in your footsteps in this. And we'll have the joy and the privilege of watching people experience through us the love that you have for them. Would you do that over and over again? Maybe even this afternoon or tomorrow morning as we roll into work or show up for school. For your sake, King Jesus, for your fame. And we'll be delighted to see what you do. Amen.